Uh, our second uh, item today is for the committee to agree to take agenda item four in private. This item is to discuss standing order rule changes in relation to the budget process. Uh, do members agree to take this in private? Thank you very much. Uh, we move to agenda item three, and it's for the committee to take evidence on its inquiry into sexual harassment and inappropriate conduct. And joining us today are Susan Duffy, Group Head of Committees and Outreach, uh, David McGill, Assistant Chief Executive, and Vicky McSherry, Culture of Respect Team Leader for the Scottish Parliament. Um, and thank you very much for joining us this morning. I'm going to start off uh, asking um, some questions about the, the action plan. And I wonder if you can tell the committee uh, when the final action plan will be published and what the implementation will look like. Well, at the moment, we are, we've set up a joint working group. Um, the three of us are, are on this with representatives of all of the political parties. And we'll be talking to them about um, how we're going to implement a more detailed action plan. We, we set out the broad um, thrust of uh, what we want to do in our next steps uh, document. Um, Vicky probably would like to maybe say a bit more just about some of the, the detail because we're looking at some priority areas that we want to take forward. Yeah, so we set out, taking the, the next steps that we published, we set out an outline, uh, timescales if you like, and that was agreed by the last meeting of the working group. The, so, so we've set out the priorities, I mean, I think one of the main priorities that we're looking at to deal with, first of all, is um, the reporting procedures, because it's really important, obviously, that we, that we tackle that first. Um, but before we get to... Um, uh, reviewing the actual procedures, we want to take, take a wee bit of time to gather more information from uh, people who work in the building. So one of the first things that we're going to do is um, hold focus groups and we're going to invite people to come along to them so that we can get further um, sort of uh, uh, qualitative information from them in terms of what they want to see the reporting procedures to look like. We'll then take that for, forward a wee bit further in terms of looking at what our policies are like. So we've got the, these broad timescales in place, we've got priorities in place, um, and then I think from the top of my head what the, the timeline is looking like is several months. I mean, as I say, we want to take the time to, to get it right. Um, we've got training outlined in that, which will take us up to later in the year. Can I ask some specific questions then about, about the working group? So how regularly is the working group meeting? Um, we're set up to meet um, every fortnight, although we, we, we cancelled the meeting uh, this week, but we're, we're meeting uh, regularly on a, a Wednesday morning. And we're, obvious, we're also wanting to be very transparent about everything that happens, and so we've got a page on our website where we publish the minutes and the agendas and the papers from the, the meetings. Okay. And you, Vicky, spoke about focus groups. Mm -hmm. So are those going to be open to all, uh, all pass holders? Are they going to be by invitation? How is that going to work? They'll be open to all pass holders, um, so we'll put um, a call out for people who are particularly interested, who want to come along, who want to input to um, our next steps and what the procedures are going to look like. Okay. And can I ask a little bit uh, about the um, how the action plan is going to address the underreporting? I mean, the survey results said the most common uh, response to experiencing sexual harassment or sexist behaviour was to do nothing. I think that was 45% of, of the respondents gave that as, as what, what happened. Um, how, how, how do you foresee you tackling that particular issue? I mean, one of the things that we're hoping is the fact that we have um, we have put that you know that this is this is in the spotlight and that we are doing a lot of work, particularly around what and we're making a we'll make a sort of public um, declaration of what's acceptable, what's not acceptable behaviour, so that people hopefully realise that something that they might have dismissed as banter in the past is something that's not acceptable and will be treated seriously. So a lot of what we're hoping to do and through the training as well is about prevention, is about um, making people realise um, the the impact that their behaviour can have on, on other people and what. We're hoping, I mean, that you know, our reporting mechanisms will be one way of doing this. But what we're hoping is that by creating this culture where we're saying we have, you know, is, is zero tolerance, and we'll explore exactly what that means uh, in, in practice, that people 
will feel from that that they can have the confidence to come forward and that things will be taken seriously. And as you were saying, convener, looking at the, 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 the results, there was a large number of people who didn't think something was serious enough to, to report. And as I say, I think this is something that we need to try and, and get across, that people perhaps in the past have maybe put up with things, thought something was banter, thought something should just be put up with. But if we send out a clear message that that's not acceptable, we hope that that will help it with that. Anyone else care to comment? Can I just ask that then, and, and sorry, I'm backtracking a little bit here in terms of focus groups. So how are you going to uh, invite or encourage staff who are based in constituency offices to be able to participate in that? You know, some obviously members come from right across the whole of Scotland um, and it's perhaps not as easy for them to, to travel. Have you looked at other ways of engaging with them, perhaps through you know um, teleconferencing or so on? Yeah, I mean, that's absolutely something that, 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 that we'll be looking at. It's also something that follows through as well, I suppose, to the, the training. You know, when we start our training programme, that training is for all as well. So that's for people that are based obviously all around the country. So, you know, we need to look at ways in which we can deliver that training and also in terms of the focus, the focus groups so that we can ensure that everyone who wants to take part in that can do. So we'll be looking at lots of different formats for that. Okay. Jamie, you wanted to come in on this? Thank you very much, Convener. You covered one of the points I was going to ask about the constituencies, but um, uh, obviously you're inviting uh, people that might want to get in, uh, involved, but how, how will you ensure that they are representative of all the different users of this of this building? Um, so, you know, lots of people in different roles, different times that they work, etc. How will you ensure that uh, we get a good cross-section cross, cross, uh, cross section of the people that work here? I think because people are self-selecting, it won't necessarily be that you know you'll you'll get the people that attend will be proportionate to the people that work here. Um, obviously, people have had the opportunity through the survey to give their views through that. So we've got a lot of you know really good information from that anyway. This is, I suppose, taking it about to to the next level really with people who potentially people who have experienced sexual harassment. This is giving them an opportunity and a confidential. Uh, environment to maybe um, uh, give uh, a bit more information in terms of wh how what we'd encourage them to report. You know, uh, so it's not necessarily because people are self-selecting. It's not necessarily going to be representative of the of everyone that works here. Okay, thank you, Patrick. Thanks. Good morning. Um, just wanted to explore the uh, under-reporting issue a, a little more. Um, and in particular, try to get a, a sense of what the survey results tell you about the, the potentially different reasons, uh, reasons that perhaps might be in tension even between different uh, motivations for underreporting or causes of underreporting. Um, one of the one of the examples that we've discussed is whether, uh, for some people, the idea that uh, if they make a complaint, it'll be ignored or treated trivially or not taken seriously is a reason for under-reporting. And perhaps for other reasons, for other people who are in different circumstances, they might not report something because they fear it would be taken really, really seriously and become a big issue and uh, perhaps uh, become publicly known about or, or known about more widely amongst their colleagues. The action plan, if it's going to res respond to under-reporting, needs to get a sense of what those different factors might be. What, have you got anything to say about what those range of, of reasons might be and, and that tension between treating something too seriously and not seriously enough? I mean, you make a, a very good point, and, and just going back to what Vicky was saying about focus groups, that's why some of the, um, the focus groups will um, want to, to, to look at um, particularly people who, in the, the survey, because those who had who had experienced sexual harassment or sexist behaviour were least likely to say that they, uh, that they thought that they could report things and would like to use these focus groups to explore that a bit further, because as you say, there can be many reasons that people don't want to, to report the, 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 the overwhelming, uh, the, sorry, the, 
the, the highest percentage was that people thought it might have a negative uh, consequence on their career. So as you say, you have the spectrum from somebody thinking it's not going to be taken seriously enough to somebody thinking it's going to be taken so seriously that there are going to be repercussions for, for them. And it's just trying to dig a bit deeper. Now, obviously, we, we had um, some comments through the survey, but we really want to sort of dig a bit deeper, um, particularly with people who feel that they've experienced this and what they felt the barrier was um, for them not coming forward. Um, another... Um, issue which came out quite strongly from the survey was um, people's need for confidentiality. Um, is there anything to suggest that the reasons for underreporting or the, the causes of underreporting might be different in relation to MSPs than uh, complaints about members of SPCB staff? Obviously, as a committee, we're responsible for uh, the code of conduct and, and a lot of those issues uh, that don't apply to SPCB staff but I think there's a general mood that we want to achieve the same standard of, of response to the issue of sexual harassment uh, in relation to MSPs. And we're aware that that's a substantial number of the, the people who've responded to the survey uh, uh, have talked about uh, behaviour by MSPs. Uh, is, the, is this a, a distinctive issue in terms of the reasons why somebody might not report issues around party loyalty or issues around you know, whether something goes into the public domain? Um, I mean, I think from the survey results um, themselves, it's, it's it's difficult to say that there is, is there is something distinct. I mean, looking at the, the the figures, a lot of things seem to be common across um, you know a number of categories of, of of respondents. But that would be another reason why we'd like to to look at this in the the focus groups to see if there are particularly some you know different issues. I mean, I think um, again going back to what I was saying earlier on about confidentiality. I mean, I think wherever people work within this building, they know that this is a this is a place which is under the the, the media spotlight, and uh, and yes, I think you know some people will you know will be worried that um, although that their name will be will, you know will not be uh, mentioned that basically there will be a spotlight on them, and I think sometimes that can uh, have an impact on whether people want to come forward or not. And I think just finally the the, the suggestion about getting a. Uh, uh, what's been described as a standalone global policy on, on sexual harassment, so something that applies throughout the, the building. Uh, have you identified any barriers to including MSPs within that? That's obviously something that the committee has, has discussed and uh, there are some com complexities that arise from that. Um, it's something that we're looking at very carefully um, we're aware that the, the Westminster Parliament has uh, decided to produce a code of behaviour for Parliament so that would apply to not just people who work in the building but people who visit the building as well so I think they've termed that everybody who engages with the parliamentary community and that's something that we're very interested in and we think it would provide that absolute focus at the top level um, and there's no reason that we can see that something similar here couldn't be used as the the kind of highest level strategic approach to harassment and bullying for everybody who works in the building including members um, what we can't do then though is provide a single source that goes beyond that that would be the um, the statement which would then guide the different strands of reporting and sanctions um, through the, the appropriate mechanisms that w we have in place just now, but it would provide that overall focus. It's something we're really keen to look at. So the suggestion would be then that once that's in place, uh, compliance with it is, is part of the Code of Conduct for MSPs? Mm -hmm. Yes, that's, that's, that's the way that we would see that happening, yes. Okay, thank you. Alexander. Thank you, convener. The the survey identified that there was a, a culture or an atmosphere about individuals not feeling comfortable at, at, at coming forward and it was discouraging them, they felt, from, from, from making the, the initial impact. Uh, so how, how are we going to try and manage that situation? What can we do to monitor and what can we do to provide assurances to people that that, that, that whole culture that we seem to have uh, needs to be addressed? Uh, and, and how will you manage that? Um, I mean, as David was saying, um, you know, we'll hopefully we'll, we, you know, we'll look at something which is um, an overarching statement, if, if, you, if you want to call it that, something which is a, a, akin to, the, you know, this is behaviour that, that is, is, is acceptable and not acceptable. And that what we're hoping with that is that that sends a message out 
um, to people about what will be tolerated, what will not be tolerated, and the kind of culture that we want to, to work within. Because, I mean, one of the things, when we looked at the, the survey results, what was most um, disappointing to me was the number of people who did feel that they didn't have confidence in, in being able to, to come forward. And <clears throat> as I say, I think that would be a, a variety of things. One of the things that we're, we're, we've talked about is that we've got so many different um, lines of reporting that we want to make sure that we make that as simple as, as, as we can, but with the caveats that, David's, that, that, that David mentioned. But I think the, the main thing is is about the, this culture shift is is to say to people, no, we want to work in a place where people are valued, where people are respected. Those are the values of the institution. Those are the values that we expect everyone to, to ad adhere to. And that means that if you experience anything uh, where you're not treated in that way, that we'll take that seriously. And, and it's about engaging with the confidence uh, within the authorities that we have within this parliament to ensure that, that everything will be taken seriously, that everyone will be treated uh, correctly uh, because I think that is also uh, a problem that some some people feel they're frightened uh, of the consequences they're frightened of the the potential publicity uh, because of this environment it's not a normal working environment where we're under the spotlight much more so trying to manage that confidence will be very difficult for you to get that across uh, and and monitoring that on a six months or year basis uh, might be the way of managing that is that your plan yeah i mean what we would like to do is because we we you know we want to see things shifting we want to see things changing so we and um, part of what we want to do is to look at you know how best we we monitor that whether it's in a, a year's time that we that we ask people what their experience has 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 been um ironically um if people, you know, it might be that we have perhaps some more people having reported because they feel more able to to, to report. But we want to be able to, to make sure that the, the policies that we've put in place have, have you know have made a difference. And and you touched on that the Westminster are introducing. Uh, are there any other areas that we looked at, and other parliaments or other facilities that that do something slightly different that maybe tries to uh, break down that barrier? I mean, we've we've looked across the piece, and we've also we we have a, an external expert who helps us with our, our working group. And I mean, our our um, impression is that there's not an awful lot out there that that, that we can actually um, draw on. We are quite a sort of unique um, organisation. Um, so a lot of the things that we have uh, we have seen um, are a lot of the things that we're you know sort of trying to do. But I think, to be perfectly frank, I think everybody's grappling with this at the at the moment, and I don't think anybody you know has the answers. But I think the fact that everyone is is actually trying to address that as, a, as something positive. It may help if I said that there was um, a piece of work that we kicked off before um, the, the publicity around about sexual harassment anyway, looking at organisational culture. And we do recognise that culture change is extremely difficult and takes a long period of time. Um, but the challenge for us it really is to get away from just trying to capture bold statements and really deliver that environment they all want to, to, to work in. And what we've been doing here is, alongside refreshing our organisational values, we've been trying to establish the standards of behaviours that underpin all of that, so that all members of staff and all members of staff who are managers know what standards of behaviours are required and accepted of them. Um, looking at the member side, if we do go down the route of having a, an overall behaviour code or something similar like that, that's something that we can use with the, the induction of MSPs after elections, we can use it to support members when they're recruiting their staff. So it becomes a, a practical document, not just a bold statement. And that's that's how we see the, the culture and the environment changing over time. Thank you, Convener. Eileen. Thanks, Convener. Um, yes, yeah, so just could I follow up on that actually before I ask you something else, please? Does that mean that um, MSP staff who are office managers who have got a sort of managing people role as well as MSPs would be um, included in the, the specific training that would take place? That's what we're looking at, that. yes. We're, we're looking at covering all categories of people who, who work in the building and contribute to our culture. Because sometimes um, the, the idea of small teams can also be a factor that maybe stops people reporting things as well. So... Could I ask you about the posters that have been around the building? Um, obviously, if you think about things like change, you'll see posters that, that say on change, you know, we will not tolerate abuse of our staff, and they're everywhere. Um, the posters that are around this building, where, where exactly are they? Are they in public areas as well? Should they be in areas like this committee room, for example, where 
that the public are coming as well? Should those posters be more widely around the building, do you think? As far as I'm aware, they are in some of the public areas. Okay. Probably more so, not in the public areas, but there are um, some certainly in, the, in that side of the building. Um, they're in all the lifts, they're in all the, they're in mm -hmm. the public toilets, um, as well as the, the uh, spaces uh, that aren't open to the public. And do you think that that has been helpful? Are you getting feedback on that? Just, in, I suppose that builds on what Susan Duffy was saying about um, just drawing people's attention to what is and isn't appropriate behaviour and making sure that, that there is a cultural change and an educational change. Are these posters having an impact? I mean, um, I mean, I can only sort of talk anecdot anecdotally. I, I did have a, a visitor in here one day and I was taking them up in the lift and he noticed the, the, the poster and he said... Wow, I think he said I really like that poster. I love the fact that you've got a message on that that the victim is not to to blame. Um, so he, you know, he was very struck um, by it. Um, so I don't know if anybody else has had any feedback about the poster. I think there was a bit of feedback through the survey as well. Um, and uh, you know, if it's raising awareness, then it's doing a big part of its job. Um, and it's getting the telephone number out there again. It's doing a big part of its job. It's it. Obviously, the posters were um, one of the first things that we did, so that's only the beginning. It's the, the beginning of um, raising the awareness, I think, overall. But I think the posters are quite bold in the statement that they make, which obviously is sexual harassment has no place at the Parliament. So are you confident, then, that the action plan is going to um, make that sentiment a reality? I mean, that is that is certainly our intention because, you know, we talk a lot about this, we talk a lot about zero tolerance and the, the thing that we need to do with all of this is to understand what that actually means in practice and be very clear about what that means in practice and that everything that we do flows from that so that, yes, it's not just, um, you know, words on a poster, that we actually take that through with, with all of the actions that we, that we, that we take. Okay, thanks. Can you... Jamie, did you want in here? Yeah, it was just a very, very quick one. Um, obviously, as you say, the posters, we've been just been talking about the posters, but can I just confirm there is information, the information on the website too, so that somebody that's come in and visited the Parliament, maybe either seen or, or been involved in an incident, they can go to the website, and that's very clearly um, clearly available on the on the website? Absolutely. It's open to... Um, it's on the internet rather than just the intranet pages, so it's open to people who don't work here as well. It is. OK, yeah. thank you. Thank you, convener, and good morning to the panel. One of the huge challenges is maintaining the anonymity of one who wishes to make a complaint, um, and recent events have illustrated um, how challenging that can be. I'd just like to hear any comments about what can be done to protect the anonymity of people who wish to come forward, because clearly this is a huge issue which can certainly have a, a negative impact in, put in allowing people to make that decision to come forward. I think you're absolutely right, and, and I think that's probably quite a big factor in people choosing not to report. Um, for us, I suppose it's around um, you know, instilling that confidence in people. When we are looking at the processes that we are going to put in place, absolutely confidentiality become, is at the top of the list. Um, to a certain extent, as it is now. Um, but it's really about instilling that confidence in people that um, the whole process is um, tight and it's around them. I don't think we can guarantee anonymity. anonymity. Um, when we're dealing with formal complaints. But that's certainly something that we need to look at when we're drawing those processes up. I mean, I think this is, I mean, when we've been talking about this, it's, it's, it's one of the issues that we, that we grapple with. Obviously, you have confidentiality, but then, as, as Vicky was saying, there's anonymity uh, as, as well. And it's how you, you balance um, all of that, because you've obviously got to make sure that the process is fair to, to everyone uh, as, as well. And I know certainly this will be something that we'll be looking at going forward, because it's, it's, it's not easy. It's, it's not easy. Um, and we, you know, I think we'll be looking across the piece to see if there are other systems um, um, which um, have some kind of you know, system of anonymity within that and how actually we would take that, that forward. There's always a danger that attends anything, any high profile case that media coverage can potentially compromise or be perceived to compromise the integrity of the process. 
How do you work to mitigate that risk? I mean, I think that I mean it come. I mean, again, it comes back to even for us confidentiality uh, again, and you know, and not um, commenting on things that, that that basically that we will investigate um, issues on a confidential um, basis. As I said, you know, as has been said before, we, you know, we work in a, a unique environment where there is a, a media spotlight. But certainly, when um, when we are ever dealing with issues like this, we, you know, we deal with them on a confidential basis. Yeah, I mean, our dignity work policy, which covers the the staff of the parliament and contractors that work here, is very people centred, um, and that's something that that we take as extremely important in this process. Um, we also note that the Westminster report, um, when it discusses the various reporting strands um, that can come out of, of complaints, says that these should be progressed um, with respect to the wishes of the complainant. And that's something we're taking a very close cognizance of. All of our policies uh, at the moment are built on that basis, but the, the refreshing process that we'll be doing will be having that as one of its key priorities. Uh, the prospect of having an external independent figure who can investigate and report on sexual misconduct. In your views, what are the pros and cons of that? And in particular, do you think that that would encourage uh, people to report more or less? Um, in terms of the first part of your question, the pros and cons, I mean, the pros... Um, probably easier to, to look at. I mean, it would take away any sort of um, suggestion that complaints were simply managed out of the system, that there was undue um, influence brought to bear by a particular party who had an interest in the outcome of a complaint. Um, that might be one um, kind of pro that uh, people would be looking for. Um, in terms of cons, um, it, that would possibly create another layer of bureaucracy. We would possibly lose something in terms of the relations that we have in the parliament. We all work closely together. We know each other. We know um, each other's motivations, that kind of thing. Um, in terms of reporting, um, I would only be guessing about whether um, I would say that an independent process would bring greater confidence and, and lead to, to greater reports, greater numbers of reports being lodged. I wouldn't know until that was put in place. Moving on then, in terms of the actual survey, did the survey report or look at whether complainers were satisfied with the outcome and the resolution of, of their complaints? And are you aware of any specific dissatisfaction that people have noted with their experiences? Um, well, we... Um <laughs> Sorry, I've got I've got the I've got the survey tagged in various places. <laughs> I mean, what we did was we um, we'd asked for reasons for for people sort of not re reporting incidents. So and we also then gave a free text box at the at the end. So we weren't specifically um, asking people um, if they were satisfied with the outcome of a, a process that had, had taken place. But some of the comments that, that, that came through would perhaps be because um, somebody had had an experience and it hadn't, you know, and, and it hadn't been a, a good experience. But this is one of the things that we're wanting to find out with the, the focus groups. And again, it's kind of delving deeper because there was a lot of questions that we wanted to try and ask for the, the survey, but we also wanted to make it relatively manageable. So it's one of the things that we want to try and ask um, people in the focus groups, particularly those who feel they might have gone through the process, you know, you know, what outcome, you know, did they want? Um, what outcome um, did they get? And did that ha would that have an impact on whether they would report or not in the, in the future? So that we can try and get a bit more detail about that. Thank you. If I can just come in on the back of Kate's first question regarding um, an external um, investigator. It, it complements my previous question about anonymity or confidentiality. Confidentiality independence of process. This is about someone who makes a complaint having confidence within the system. I just wonder in terms of what role, well I appreciate it's not within your remit and it's for Parliament, but what role sanctions and confidence and what the consequences could be for someone who perpetrates an act of sexual misconduct 
there isn't a clear path or journey necessarily or a clear sense of what the outcome could be. How important do you think addressing that point is um, to enabling and giving confidence to people to come forward and make a complaint? I think, um, again, it comes back to keeping the complainant at the centre of the process. Um, I mean, I think if your question was about setting out um, a range of sanctions in advance, um, I'm not sure that that would be entirely compatible with keeping the, the person's wishes paramount um, through the, the complaint process. I think we'd also need to be careful that um, this element of independence that we're talking about would be very much at the investigation stage, that reports would still have to come into the appropriate body determined by the employment relationship, and those different bodies would have different policies and procedures in place, some which may include sanctions and some which may not. Um, we have noted at Westminster that the suggestion is that the, the Commissioner there has given a, a new range of lower-level sanctions which she can impose, which include things like um, requesting an apology from the person who perpetrated the behaviour or requiring that person to go on training before um, the complaint would come back in for more serious issues to be dealt with, again, internally by the Standards Committee down there and ultimately by the, the, the Chamber of, of, of Westminster. Do you think a scenario where an MSP can admit to sexual misconduct or sexual harassment and can continue to work in the Scottish Parliament building, do you think that will hinder people coming forward to make a complaint? I think there's, there's, there's every chance that that's key, the key, that would be the case. I mean, I think you're, you're asking us to make a, a value judgment here, which is probably not appropriate for us to make, but that would be a danger that we would be taking into account when we are looking at policies and when we're speaking to people about what those policies should provide. Yeah. Of not to make a value judgment at a time, but would that constitute good policy or good practice in any other organisation, in your opinion? I mean, I think one of, um, as we say, there's a lot of different, you know, employment um, relationships um, w within here in terms of our, our staff. Um, we have got a, you know, a, a clear policy. We've got a policy. We, we have got um, sanctions, and uh, the ultimate sanction, of course, can can be dismissal f f from 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 this. Other um, categories of, uh, of of people who who work here are not in that that same um, situation. Do you think that inconsistency is problematic? I, th I mean, I, I think when we, we came here the, the, the first time, I think we said that there were a number of complexities around uh, the different reporting mechanisms, but that there were reasons for some of those complexities because there is a different, uh, you know, because there is a different relationship. It's, it's thing, who is the employer? Because ultimately, come in terms of, of sanctions, who then is the employer? Who is then in the position to be able to to, um, to put sanctions on someone? I simply ask because I appreciate you have to operate within a, a restricted framework, and ultimately, the powers and provisions are we this committee holds in terms of making recommendations, and ultimately for Parliament to decide. But thank you. Thank you. Just to to follow up on this a little bit. Clearly, not every complaint, not every, not even every upheld complaint would result in dismissal. Uh, you know, that's a very serious step to, to take. Um, but I, I would hope uh, that you can at least tell us that the focus groups that you're going to have will discuss with people and try to understand what expectations people would have uh, of whether MSPs in principle should be capable of being held to the same standard as members of SPCB staff in those very serious circumstances and, and do you intend to have a discussion within those focus groups about whether that option should exist and if so how it would be exercised uh, in order to minimize the additional stress that would come from a high profile or even politicized uh, decision making process um i mean with, I mean, within the, the focus groups, we will be, you know, what we were talking about um, standards earlier on. There is, you know, there's one issue about, you know, the standard that we will all be held to. But obviously, what you're then talking about are the different 
types of, of sanctions on, on, on different people. We haven't specifically thought about including that in the in, in the, the, the focus groups. I mean, one of the things that we're very conscious of um, with the work that we're doing with the, the joint working group is obviously this committee's inquiry and any findings that, that, that you might have, particularly in relation to the Code of Conduct, and we want to be able to take account of that in any of the, 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 the work that we are doing so that everything basically gels together. I think that, that single standard that you, you mentioned there has to be the aim. I mean, I think if, we, if we're serious about looking at this um, from the point of view of the, the person who's on the receiving end of inappropriate behaviour and the impact on those individuals, the impact is the same regardless of who the perpetrator is. So I think going back to the discussion we had earlier on about having that behaviour code for the parliamentary community in the way that Westminster seems to be going, that gives us that, that single focus that applies to everyone equally, regardless of whether you're an elected member, whether you're a visitor, whether you're a member of staff. That, that's helpful. I was just trying to ask the question in a way that, that keeps it very general and, and doesn't make it difficult to answer. Um, you know, the, if, if what you're aiming for is something which ends the situation where MSPs <coughs> have a unique level of protection from consequences, uh, you know, I, I think it's that the next step is to is to discuss how that can be reached. I think that the difference just comes in at the the stage of the the imposition of sanctions. That has to be a different process, um, but we, we recognise that. Alexander, following on from that, we, we we've touched on the idea of a, a member who has admitted misconduct uh, and is still allowed to be in the premises. What is the Parliament doing in measures to protect the victim and also to monitor? any further misconduct under that circumstance? Because that's a live situation. In a, in a situation like that, um, we would use our usual informal channels. Um, we, we don't necessarily need to have a, a, a process which, which is applied here. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we, we, we work closely together with members. We, we know um, how members work. We have good relations. Um, we would seek to work with business managers and particular parties. And those are the, the channels we would use to, to monitor and manage a situation like that. And also trying to protect the victims? Absolutely, yes. They, they, they're the focus? Yes. yes You've that mentioned that a number of times already, that, that they have to continue to be the focus? Absolutely, yeah. Thank you. Elaine? Uh, just briefly, um, so in the survey, the, the percentage of um, the perpetrators that were members of parliament is, I think it was around 45%. So do you know who those members are? Have they been approached? Has, has action been taken at all following on from that? Or did the anonymity um, also include a sort of more vague reporting of it? Um, I mean, we don't know who um, who those those people are because, in terms of the the the, the, the survey, um, we were asking people for their experiences, but it wasn't going to be a way of, of anybody naming a anybody. I mean, one of the things in terms of the the percentages is that now we don't know whether that's a lot of different people or whether it's it's the, it's the same person. So, you know, it's, it's hard to tell, you know, um, f uh, from that, and we we didn't sort of break it down um, further than than that. Thank you. Can I thank the panel for coming along and, and um, giving us evidence this morning? I'm sure we'll find that very helpful. Um, and we will now uh, move into private session as previously 